Senator Joe Manchin, a Democrat from West Virginia who has represented his state for the last 10 years, tweeted out a very reasonable take a few days ago in response to the calls from his party to defund the police. And he said that he's a proud West Virginia Democrat who wants his party to be the party of working men and women and that he wants to protect the jobs and health care of Americans and that his party shouldn't be about some socialist agenda, nor should they ever entertain the idea of defunding the police. And so man to man, I can respect these takes. I would imagine that at the end of the day, we share the same goals despite our partisan or ideological differences. But Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez just decided to respond to this with a picture of herself pouting and glaring at Joe Manchin, and it got over half a million likes on Twitter. And politically speaking, Joe Manchin is actually helping the Democrats, but AOC is a woman whose maturation seems to have capped at about 15, so she can't really recognize that because she wants to have an epic clapback moment on Twitter so that she can siphon dopamine via the approval of lonely women and pathetic men. And I'm not saying that women don't belong in politics, by the way. I would never say that, ever. And if, if I catch you saying, oh, I'm going to get so, I'm going to, I'm going to punch you in the mouth with my fists 1920 times maybe even if you're a woman too so that you know your place which is in politics we're kidding around that's a joke we do a little trolling it's called we do a little trolling of course women belong in politics it's estrogen that's the problem that explains all the weak effeminate men too it's the iron law of politics but that being said we have to go over the civil war in the democratic party why it's happening what it means for the future of their party and for the future of our country because it would seem that they are now trying to use their power and influence that they've amassed <laughs> i can't believe i said that <laughs> throughout the last several decades to finally execute their agenda without breaking and without compromise all with the help of the brainwashed masses um and even despite the comparatively moderate members still on their party whose days are likely numbered so do stay tuned john doyle in heck off commie Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Commie. Sorry to keep you waiting, folks. Complicated business, complicated business. I apologize yet again for the delay. We've been traveling. We've been rallying people to see what the hell is going on with the election. We've been in Twitter jail. We are at the Million MAGA March. Met so many beautiful people, so many tremendous people. And that really seems to be the motif in any sort of conflict or struggle, whether it's a political battle, a cultural battle, even a military battle. It, it seems that the highlight is always the people that you meet along the way and with whom you fight alongside. So that's always very special. So shout out to everyone I met this weekend. Shout out JJ. Shout out Laugh Track. All the boys in the Hawk Squad. The HOC Expanded Universe. It was epic. During the actual march, we had like this mob of 25 high energy, high IQ people. We were mobbing around, keeping the energy high. It was epic. That was probably the best part. Second best part was that I almost fought this Antifa guy, which was also epic. Um, and I have to say, I'm against fighting. I'm against violence. I disavow that. But there's something about conflict that just excites you as a man. And so basically, the morning of the march, we were walking there. It was me, cameraman Badan, Red Eagle Politics, and the head of um, the head admin of our Discord server. And so we've all got the MAGA hats on because it never comes off. And we're just walking, minding our own business, taking our time, talking to each other, whatever. And so we get to this intersection, and we're waiting to cross. And on the opposite side of the intersection, there's this group of like middle-aged women, a few of them. They've all got their Trump gear. They've got their Trump flags. And so we see um, we see them, and they immediately like call over to us, like, hey, this guy's following us. He's stalking us. And so I look, and I see this Antifa guy LARPing in black block. He's got his face covered, and he's just standing very close to these women without saying anything. And so we started crossing the street um, and we're going to their side and they're coming to our side. And sure enough, this guy's just following them. Um, and in case you don't know, what these people will do is they'll get all dressed up and they try to intimidate Trump supporters or dox them or sometimes even attack them while coordinating with other people in their group. It's literally weaponized LARPing. But anyways, as we're getting closer um, and we're passing each other, I started like yelling at him like, hey, you know, there's police over there if you want to go talk to them, which by the way was sort of true. Like there was a police car set up to block the street, but I didn't see any actual police officers. And so then I was like, you know, bro, I'm literally cringing at you right now. Like you are LARPing. You are pathetic. Don't you have anything else better to do? And so they get to the other side of the street um, and then the women like turn to cross again and this guy sort of like broke off from them and kept walking and so I yelled yeah get the f out of here and then he looked back and he started kind of walking towards us and so I was like yeah let's do it so I started walking towards him and then he turned his back and then he, he kept walking away which was cool but also disappointing I kept yelling at him though as he walked away because we need to demoralize these people and, and get them to recognize themselves for the pathetic cowards that they are. And that's really why I got involved. Like, yeah, part of it was because he was harassing our women for Trump, our moms for Trump. We love our seven percenters, but mostly it was just because I wanted the conflict. So that was fun. There was also something very poetic about walking through downtown D.C., wearing MAGA hats and being literally screamed at by these D.C. city rats from the balconies of their $4,000 a month apartments. Like, we're walking around, four young guys, all grew up in the Midwest, all grew up middle class, and we just want to make our country great again by liberating 
liberating it from corruption. And not coincidentally, the people in Washington, D.C., a city that went 93-4 for Biden, they had a big problem with that. And it's because they're out of touch. They're self-righteous and they are incredibly pretentious. These are the worst people in the country. They are parasites. That actually transitions nicely into what we're talking about because the Democratic Party has always been home to the liberal elites. But they used to feel a sense of responsibility, actually, towards the working class, perhaps misguided since judging by many of their policies, it would seem that they were more concerned with appearing to want to help the working class rather than actually helping the working class. But the point is that their party has now evolved to resent the working class, specifically the white working class, which historically has been the backbone of their party. And it has now reached a point where they resent the white working class because they view them as uncultured. They view them as uneducated. They view their ties to God, community, and country as archaic, as outdated. But they don't extend the same feelings towards minorities in the working class because according to them, the reason that minorities are even in the working class in the first place is because of white people and the systems of white supremacy that they've constructed. And I'm not terribly familiar with, with Joe Manchin's voting record. I know that he's basically a moderate Democrat, especially when compared um, to his new constituents. But there is a reason that he's been representing West Virginia, a state that Donald Trump won by 42 points in 2016 for the last 10 years, even as a Democrat. And that reason is that the reasons that West Virginia has voted one way or the other have effectively stayed the same. They're basically crystallized. And it is the parties that have changed independently of that. And I'm not an expert on politics in West Virginia. That's a different John Doyle. But I still think that it could be accurately summarized by two things. G Jesus and coal. And when the Democrats were on some, yo, workers are epic, Jesus is epic, and Republicans were on some, no, 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 big business is epic, and Jesus is epic, but not as epic as sending our kids to die in the sand so girls in the Middle East can eventually learn about gender theory, West Virginia was like, okay, gamers, let's go blue. But then, as the ideas of liberalism have progressed and evolved, as would have been logically expected, now Democrats are on some, yo, fossil fuels are cringe, you're a redneck, Jesus is fake because my atheist professor absolutely blew my pee mind with the problem of evil, you're on cultured and also racist. So West Virginia has no choice but to be like, okay, gamers, not very epic. So they've been voting strongly red for like 20 years. And they will continue to vote strongly red as the new Republican Party cements itself as the party of the working class, the party of American families, and the party of recognizing and preserving all that makes America great. It's actually, it's, it's really easy to win elections. All you have to do is be socially conservative and support free markets through a moral lens, which effectively means Lemonade stands, yes. Mass marketing drugs to disillusion Americans to profit off their addiction, no. Designing algorithms to get 11-year-old boys addicted to pornography to profit off ad revenue. Face the wall, that's a joke. That's a joke, but if you do that, you'll win 70% of the vote. That's how we win, by the way. Like, that's the path forward for conservatives in America. A lot of people like to disagree with that so they can collect a $15,000 speaking fee for reciting the same Cold War talking points to an audience of baby boomers who still think that the left will just figure it out once they start paying taxes. But it's true. We're correct, and the Republican establishment is corrupt. But the good news is that we're not going anywhere anytime soon. We're still here, and you're going to listen to us and submit to our will because we're done just passively reflecting like, oh, yeah, you know, I suppose it would be nice if we can serve the country for our children. <laughs> oh, well. No, no, no. We're changing the psychology to one of victory. And as a matter of fact, we will tread on you because the stakes are too high for us to keep pretending that we can all just agree to maintain a power vacuum. No, we've tried that for 70 years. Look where we are now. We've been on the back foot for literally generations now to a point where we are now defending the legitimacy of there only being two genders. But you think that we can just employ the same psychology, the same talking points, the same Ronald Reagan nostalgia? No, 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 no. Things have changed and we will adapt because otherwise we will be finished. And very broadly speaking, this is basically what the Civil War the Republican Party is going to be about. We're already fighting it right now to a certain extent with Donald Trump being the catalyst. And, you know, you can see how quick the GOP establishment has been to throw him under the bus because they never wanted him there in the first place. And, you know, we've been talking about this, uh, this conservative civil war for the last few months on the channel. So don't think it's just the Democrats because it's us two and ours is likely going to be more consequential for the trajectory of the country. But I do want to note a few things about what's going on with the left right now. So back to what we were talking about originally with that Twitter exchange between Joe Manchin and AOC. Politically speaking, Joe Manchin is actually helping the Democrats because he's casting a wide net. He's speaking in ways that would appeal to the average American. But since AOC is operatively a 15 year old girl who's read the new Jim Crow and maybe a little bit of Howard's in, she has to have her clapback moment on Twitter. So she gets herself trending. Everyone thinks she's so epic and funny and relatable. Yes, queen, whatever. As cringe and petty as that reaction may have been, it's actually good for us in a way because even though she's very influential, uh, she's good at aggrandizing parts of the democratic base. She herself is inherently polarizing to people in her party and people who have likely been in her party long before her who aren't exactly in favor of the direction that it's taken for the last decade or so. And so while that direction is alarming, it provides an opening for us and not an opening in the way you might think. Um, a lot of people see stuff like this. They see liberals who claim to be leaving the left or they'll see Joe Manchin declare that defunding 
the police probably isn't a good idea. And they're like, uh, based? Uh, Joe Manchin is based? He's one of us now? And it's like, no, no, he's not. He's still a liberal Democrat. Nothing is more emblematic of the leftward paradigm shift in this country than the fact that the right is now embracing these figures as though it's a victory for them. Like, oh yeah, we've got this transgender atheist feminist who sells psychedelic drugs to teenagers, but she thinks that guns are cool and taxes should be marginally lower, which means she's on our side and we're winning. Like, what does that say about the coalition? Like us as a coalition, we're now absorbing these types of people simply because there's an overlap on one or two issues. And I'm not saying that we can't have a big tent movement, but you can't be a liberal and be a conservative. That's just not how that works. Not literally, not philosophically, politically, it just doesn't work that way. Just because you reject aspects of leftism, which is the natural and logical progression of liberalism, doesn't mean that you are all of a sudden able to come tell conservatives uh, that we need to adjust our beliefs to accommodate you. If you want to vote for our guys, great. But don't come over here trying to change our side because you're too ignorant to realize that your side didn't, oh, just get a little bit out of control, but rather they evolved in exactly the ways that we predicted for decades. And if we let you corrupt our side with your ideas, then we're just going to have nothing left. So no thanks. Conservatives can't expect to conserve America if they can't even conserve conservatism. That's really, that's it. Like, that's all. The path forward for conservatives isn't to emulate the left. It's to exploit the weaknesses of the left to assert itself. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. But Joe Manchin, AOC, that's the conflict that we're seeing in the Democratic Party, roughly speaking. And what's going to happen is that AOC will win that battle, but will ultimately lose the war for the future of our country. It would actually be better for the Democrats to reject the woke mob, the perpetually evolving progressivism, the cultural entropy, all of it. But they won't do that because they can't anymore, because they don't know any better. Think about it. Remember about 10 years ago when we had the Occupy Wall Street movement? That was fun, right? You know, a little bit more mild than what we see now. And so maybe we disagree with the reasons for that movement, but in case you're not familiar, they were basically protesting in mass against wealth inequality and corporate influence in government. Now, there's some really interesting material out there, literally about the psychology of a protest. And I'd love to get into that at a later time. But what I'll say now is that much of what compels people to take to the streets like that um, is less about the cause and more about their spiritual investment in that cause. And that's important because it means that as long as you can capture someone's spiritual investment through a mixture of manufactured despair and propaganda, you can apply their energy wherever you'd like, regardless of the cause, basically. And so I'm sure that a lot of people protesting were very aware of the negative effects of corporate influence in government and how that can direct contribute to wealth inequality, but I'm also sure that a majority of people protesting didn't know that and that they were more concerned with absolving themselves of personal responsibility so as to point the finger at the man. Now, think about what else happened during roughly the same time period. All of the corporate media outlets all of the sudden started focusing on whiteness and critical race theory and gender identity and all the other adjacent concepts contained under the woke umbrella. The point being that Occupy Wall Street transformed into the woke resistance and it was done deliberately to subvert subvert and distract what was otherwise a relatively legitimate movement of people from the left, and it was funded and manufactured by the media who works alongside the major corporations that the left was challenging. And the left hasn't noticed because they are largely spiritually invested into these causes, and so they literally are unable to recognize the sleight of hand that was orchestrated by these corporations intentionally to exploit their energy to work towards their own interests, because the woke resistance fundamentally erodes all semblance of country until all that we have in common is that we're consumers. Small businesses die, big businesses businesses grow richer and it just continues like they have used their power to create a society that breeds mental illness and they have now weaponized that mental illness to where it is now self-propagating and self-sustaining and that's why we as the right need to abandon this talk of socialism and i know that's rich coming from the heck off commie guy but what's coming is not socialism america will never be a socialist country yeah that's true that's cool right but the truth is that it's going to be something much worse than socialism because we all know what socialism is. We're ready for it. But what's really on the way is much more sinister and pernicious than socialism because we won't even realize it so long as we're not standing in line for government supplies or having our speech suppressed by government organizations. But we will be waiting in line for supplies from a handful of mega corporations that have lobbied the government to destroy small businesses. And we will be having our speech suppressed by big tech companies, private tech companies who now control the flow of information in a way that dictators of days past could only have wet dreams about. Riddle me this. How is America going to become a socialist country when Twitter and Amazon have more power than the government does? Good luck with that. But here's the good news. 
This is why the future of the left is ultimately doomed. And of course, we knew that it was going to it was going to get worse before it could get better. But we will ultimately win because while the coalition that has power on the left is radical, and while they're seemingly gaining more power, they're ultimately unsustainable. And the reason for that is very simply that no coalition of people who embrace vice, who embrace degeneracy, who reject God, who have no self-control or discipline, who practice disgusting lifestyles, who are mentally ill and sick, no coalition like that could ever be sustainable. It is impossible. So in the grand scheme of things, we will inevitably win. So long as we remain sustainable through discipline and conviction. What do we say? A disciplined mind is an effective mind. And this isn't to say that we're winning now, but that they will eventually implode or be unable to manage the coalition that they've created. They're going to eat each other. I gave a very impromptu speech at the state capitol in Lansing last week, and I said this, which I stand by 100%. I said that they're riding a wave of wealth and institutional power. They have established the infrastructure, they have control over it, they have the organization and the resources and the wealth and the manpower to actualize their will upon the rest of us, but that will inexorably come crashing down. The house of cards will inexorably collapse. And when that happens, the boys are going to be there waiting. It's me and you, big guy. We will, by that point, have tens of thousands, if not more, of young men who are smart, who are determined, who have conviction, who are strong, who are disciplined, and who know God. And we will be occupying positions of power all throughout the country, whether that's in government, business, whatever. And you won't know who we are. We, we can't all be outspoken because if we do, you know, we don't want to put the target on our back. We don't want to risk losing those positions. Obviously, some people have to be outspoken. That's my job, for example. I'll get the death threats. Don't worry. But it's actually strategically advantageous for us to keep it to ourselves for the most part and become as epic and influential and wealthy and well-connected as possible. And then when the time comes, flip the switch. Can you imagine the potential of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of young men like that? That's what it would take to take our country back. The time has come. Execute Order 1776. You leave your executive office. You go purge the entire critical race theory department of your company. They're panicking. Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? And then instead of a lightsaber, you just say, you're fired. Kind of a consumer moment. Relax, but still. The ethos of the sentiment remains true, which is that we're going to win in the end. But only if we make ourselves better. We reach our potential, and then we stand back and stand by. And we use our influence and our power to take back our culture, to take back our institutions, and to take back our country. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, and you know what I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you to do it. I'm sorry, I have to share the video with a friend. Don't have friends? Problem solved. I'll be your friend. Like that VeggieTales song. I can be your friend, la la la. I can be your friend, la la la. If your, is it hair? If your hair is red or yellow. We can be friends, I'll share my jello. I can be your friend, la la la. I can be your friend, la la la. It's okay if we are different. We can still play and I will be your friend. Okay, uh, polarization cured, racism cured. Like what, what more could I possibly do? I've done my part for the day. That's gonna be, when I take power, the propaganda poster will just be a screenshot from that. Just like, I did my part today. Did you? Something like that, who knows. Thank you so much for watching. May God bless America.